We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Alrighty guys, welcome back to another episode of the show here. For me, it's like currently pissing down with rain. Paulie, are you, uh, are you copping any of that? No, but I'm assuming I'm about half an hour lagging behind you in uh, <laughs> metropolitan Melbourne. So looking forward to the rain just in time for my swim for the afternoon, which will be amazing. Just you, just you swim on the uh, on the Ashfeld outside, hey? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I've just been actually doing some hard manual labour, just been uh, shoveling shit for a good hour, which was amazing, in between, in between guests on our show, which has been uh, wonderful. I'll tell you what. Yeah. Said, and our next guest, who we're about to introduce, I, yes, I love your your take on this. I think it would be so great to have a gym based around just building shit, you know, either manual labor, uh, farming, tending to stuff that is completely natural and part of uh, you know what used to be life's day to day activity. Well, mate, um, you know, uh, as, as the, the, the scientist in me would love to know, when you're talking about the definition of shit, are you talking about, what exactly are you talking about here, sir? Oh, I the problem. Uh, no, it was a, there, there was no shit. It was soil. And there was, it was no. Sand and, <laughs> and it was, it was close. Okay. Uh, it was sand and it was um, rubble. Uh, Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Well, hey, look, let's uh, let's let's get into it a little bit. Firstly, Alex, mate, thank you so much for coming on the show. My my first question before we formally uh, introduce you is, how many times have people called you Millhouse? <laughs> Millhouse. I, I had I had a few I had a few people in college, and then also through uh, working in a hospital setting of all places, orthopedic surgeons like to give nicknames. So I, I was Millhouse Van Houten for a couple of years of that, that rotation. <laughs> That's so good. So I just, as soon as I saw your name, I just like, I like, okay, I know the first question I'm going to ask you. And, uh, yeah, and I, I love, <laughs> I'm sorry, mate. No, all good. Well, let me, um, let me formally introduce you, mate, for um, everyone listening at home. Alex has a really, uh, really intriguing uh, bio, and um, it's probably one of the reasons why Paulie and I just can't wait to pick his brain because it, it's, uh, well, look, I'll let the words speak for themselves. So Alex Van Houten began his career studying chemistry and psychology at Vanderbilt University, which, funnily enough, I'll, I'm looking forward to speaking to you about. I actually went to a, a frat party at Vanderbilt in uh, at, at one time. So uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing uh, to hearing your about your experience at Vanderbilt as well, but he went to. Didn't you guys share a tab of acid once? So... <laughs> it's, it's it's possible. That is true. I mean, I was also referred to as uh, Mill House at one point. So, uh, well, I was Mill, and Alex was House. So. <laughs> So he began his career studying chemistry and psychology at Vanderbilt University on the road to becoming an orthopedic surgeon. But when the medical field failed to provide answers about how to live well with a rare genetic disorder, Alex turned instead to the world of personal training and health coaching. Today, he's a master trainer, nutritionist, and health coach of over 17 years. Alex has served thousands of clients in their journey toward changing their stories for the better and has cultivated a reputation for practical evidence-based coaching programs. In an industry filled with fad diets and quick fixes, Alex helps individuals strive to achieve their 1% better daily in body, mind, and spirit. His current projects include owning and operating the Betterment Company, developing his Better Daily mobile app, and hosting the Better Daily podcast. He lives in Greenbrier. Did I get that right? Arkansas? Greenbrier? Greenbrier, pretty close. Briar. Oh, okay. Almost got the, the emphasis was on the uh, wrong syllable, I think, there. <laughs> <laughs> Greenbrier, Arkansas with his wife, Kristen, and his two boys, Gabriel and Bennett. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining us, dude. And thank you. Can I just say that your accent makes my bio sound way cooler than it actually is? So <laughs> <thanks for that. laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I'm actually, I'm trying to put it on as best I can, but uh, <laughs> look, honestly, mate, it's a fantastic resume. And I think, um, you know, just firstly, one of the things that really speaks to me is um, this kind of inherent uh, open-mindedness that you have, you know, I mean, mm. getting into a chemistry and psychology degree um, is a pretty 
prestigious thing from what I can imagine. And for you to kind of move on from there and try to, you know, find your own path is um, pretty courageous. Uh, did it feel like that at the time? Uh, thank you. No, it, it felt more practical at the time. I, I was very interested in getting the most I could out of Vanderbilt University. Great school, you know, minus the minus the reputation for cat parties and acid tablets. <laughs> <laughs> that's only a very small sector of the yes. campus, that's for sure. But 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 it's a it's a very uh, it's a it's a very high end from an educational perspective, high end place to be. Mm. And I was I brushed shoulders with the, some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life in in that that space. What I found was much of what we were doing in chemistry and, and psychology actually started with a chemical engineering focus and, mm. and kind of broke that up. But much of what we were doing was in front of a computer from a programming perspective. And I just like people too much for that. Now, ironically, we, we are conversing sure. the screen at the moment. Um, but, but I remember thinking like, I don't want to be stuck in front of a screen for the rest of my life. I want to help people. And mm. so, <laughs> so, so that, that really opened up into a, a pre-med focus for me. And uh, what's really cool about that is the, the focus on psychology and chemistry actually turned out to be very beneficial for me when it came to understanding clients from a metabolic perspective, for instance, mm. or understanding clients from a behavioral perspective. And so the, the, the foundation was not wasted. That's for sure. It wasn't, it wasn't jumping to a non-overlapping magisteria. It was just, it was just building on a good foundation. And I mean, this rare genetic disorder, I mean, that, that's obviously one of the things that I think would would really stick out for a lot of people uh, reading the bio and then, and then hearing about your story. Did you want to go into a little bit of detail as to what that is, um, some of the, the things that you've learned about your own body in response to having that disorder and kind of where it is now for you as well? I, sure. I, I don't mind talking about it. I'll answer whatever questions you want. I, I also hate to make this about me so is sure. it in to the extent that you guys are willing to dive into that hole and to the extent it's beneficial to your listeners let's do it so so the disorder that i have is is called euler's danlos um and i'm sure it's pronounced differently in different regions and whatnot but really fundamentally it's a difficulty synthesizing collagen in your tissues so in layman's terms what that means is if if my my tissue should have have a bunch of chain links in them to hold them together, my, my tissues have fewer. And so it makes them stretchier and less resilient than they should be. And some individuals have, have disorders of Ehlers-Danlos that affect things like cardiac tissue. And those poor souls, they don't, they don't last very long. Oh, wow. uh, my cardiac, my <clears throat> cardiac tissue holds together pretty decently, but I'm still prone to cardiovascular disease and whatnot. So, mm. so that said, I've had a lot of struggles related to digestive dysfunction, I've had a lot of struggles related to joint mobility and stability, and uh, and sometimes I wrestle with pain and stuff, and that's just part of the package. So a lot of my personal health journey has been how do I make the most of the body I've been given rather than, uh, as I've seen many people with my disorder, uh, being stuck on pain pills and in pain at 30 years old and unable to live life to its fullest. Mm. It's, it's amazing and you know it's, there's one thing that i've noticed uh um, with my own experience and many others that i've spoken to it's it's one thing to absorb information on an intellectual level but another to experience life and that's a far more kind of driving force yeah. for you to move in a certain direction in life and uh as Tommy mentioned uh, your your resume speaks for itself. There's there's uh, it's quite decorated in the sense that you've really been able to feed your mind. And I could only imagine there's a lot of meaning behind why you've been able to go down or, or chosen to go down all of those paths. And I'd love to kind of break down possibly. Let, let's let's look at what you feel have been the most um, important credentials that you've kind of explored um, that has had an impact on you and your clients. Mm, yeah, that's a good, good thought. Um, you know, from an educational perspective, I'm, I'm avidly curious. So like my wife picks on me while she hangs out at the end of a day, I wind down by reading a textbook. Like that's what I do. And, and, and she's like, what is wrong with you? And every once in a while, she knows that I'll shut it and have to teach her something about it. And, and she'll listen because she's, she's a sweetheart. But, but that, that said, 
the, the education is only as advantageous as it is when you can apply it, right? So, sure. <clears throat> uh, so I'll give you I'll give you a decent example. Um, so, from a chemistry background, it's it's interesting to note that there are a there is a chemical difference between carbohydrates and fats. A lot of people don't know the difference between carbohydrates and fats, like you know, top level, but, but it's, it's interesting to note that molecularly speaking, there's a significant difference. And the basic difference is this fats have no oxygen built into them, Mm -hmm. which means that your body has to supply oxygen in order for them to be metabolized. Mm. So fats are the fuel oxygen is the, is the other component of a combustion reaction. You put those two together and you make water and carbon dioxide. And if there's anybody listening right now who's interested in this process, you can take a deep breath with me. And then you breathe in all this oxygen. Yep, yep, yep. And then you breathe out. And what you breathe out is water, H2O, and carbon dioxide. That's why if you do that against a mirror, it kind of fogs up, right? Mm. Now the fuel is the food that you ate. And the oxygen is what you breathed in. That's what you what you brought all the way down into your lungs. It, your heart's pumping from your circuit, circulatory system. The oxygen goes into your red blood cells and carries that all the way to your cells. And then your body can combine fat and oxygen together. Boom. And now you have a combustion reaction, which is really cool, right? Mm. Now, for individuals who are cardiovascularly unfit, meaning that you're not very good at moving oxygen through your body, then your body relies on carbohydrates as fuel because carbohydrates as a molecule they have an oxygen molecule built right into them. And so carbohydrates, when you consume them, you've kind of bypassed the problem of oxygen. And so mm-hmm. there are many people who will come to me uh, in, in the work that I do with them and they'll say, hey, I want to lose some fat. And what I'll find is cardiovascularly speaking, they're going to have a really hard time burning fat as a fuel source. No wonder they're craving carbs all the time because their body's like, dude, I'm trying to burn fat, but I got no oxygen. Mm. Like, will you get up and give me some oxygen, please? And so, and so we have to deal with the problem of oxygen delivery before we can worry about trying to burn fat as a fuel source. And what really stinks for that person is oftentimes they'll be like, I guess carbs are bad for me and I have to stop eating them. And they just end up feeling like garbage. They don't see sustainable results. And, and, you know, so they're the poor people who are trying to make themselves better on this this terrible hamster wheel because well nobody taught them some chemistry along the way so (laughs) as an example that's that's uh those are some of the fundamental pieces that are really helpful in understanding what you can do to better yourself on a day-to-day basis what type of testing like since we're on that topic what type of testing process would you undertake to be able to understand whether somebody is more inclined to be able to benefit from uh like fat nutrition versus uh carbohydrate that's a very good question so today like you can make it really complicated or you can make it real simple from a complicated perspective we've got uh nutrigenomics is a is a burgeoning field right so we can do dna testing to find out whether or not your your dna predisposes you to be good at, at clearing fats from your bloodstream or whether it predisposes you to being more insulin resistant, which would mean that you you tend to rely on carbohydrates. Uh, you could also get as complicated as putting, uh, we do metabolic testing. And I say we as in the scientific community. I've done this a lot in my career. You can put a mask on somebody and see what the, the ratio of oxygen that they're breathing in versus the ratio of carbon dioxide that they're breathing out and say, hey, at this moment, you're burning this much of your your energy from carbohydrates and this much of your energy from fats and so you can understand how you might train to make that better Mm -hmm. from a simple perspective if you are deconditioned you do not need to be consuming carbohydrates on a regular basis that's all there is to it like if if you're not very well trained if if walking up a hill gets you pretty winded (laughs) then then you don't need to be consuming a large amount of carbohydrates and the reason for that is you aren't equipped to do high intensity exercise without becoming insulin resistant. Mm. And so, so in general, what we do is, is we build a base. You need a base level of cardiovascular fitness. You need to be conditioned and maybe even trained in order that you can shift your metabolic, uh, metabolic clock, your metabolic flexibility to being able to burn fat as a fuel source. Well, because we have a lot of fat on our bodies. It's I, I'm even I, I'm, I'm hanging out around 7% body fat at 170 pounds. Plus or minus, that's like 
3,500 calories in a pound of fat. I've got like 70,000 calories of fat on me right now. Like that's mm. a lot of fat. I can, I could go for a while on that, you know? <laughs> um, so, so if we have a base level of fitness to where we can burn fat as the fuel source and we're trained such that our body knows what to do with carbohydrates rather than just storing them, then we're in a good spot. And so for most of the people that I work with, I understand what their conditioning level is. And then we go from there. Alex, the, I, I, I hear a lot. So I, I work as a counselor, but I think, um, and and actually Paulie could speak to this as well. We, we actually had a podcast guest on um, earlier today who was really, um, you know, promoting the holistic model of, of health, you know, and I think mm-hmm. as, 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 as science works towards that idea, which is really cool and, 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 and the spread of information on, on social media and the internet and so forth, all of our fields are really starting to hone in on this singular idea of holistic health, which is beautiful, which is really beautiful. And, um, one of the things that I've been really interested in lately is glycogen vari- variability, insulin resistance, you mentioned as well, and the effect that some of that might have not only on physical health and the abil- inability to lose weight, but also on mental health as well. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, um, just what is actually kind of going on in in, in the body um, as people kind of overconsume carbohydrates, now insulin starts to become less um, adapted um, or efficient and, and also what's going on, um, on the mental health side of things. Mm, great question. <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to precursor this conversation to, to kind of an umbrella concept that's extremely important. And, and I teach this a lot with regard to better daily in our community. Mm. And that is, that is that our body as it exists right now, both, both in appearance and also in function is a result of our story and our DNA. Mm. You can't change your DNA, but you can change your story. Mm. And and that's important because, because all the way down to the level of our cells, what we expose ourselves to or what we've been exposed to can, can tell our body what parts of our DNA to turn on. That's called methylation or turn off. That's called acylation. And that's an entire body of research called epigenetics. That is to say, you were born with a particular genetic makeup and throughout your life, different things happened that, that told your body to turn on certain genes and to turn off certain genes. And when it comes to, when it comes to how our nutrition or how our exercise or how our daily lifestyle or even traumatic events we've experienced in our life, when it comes to how those things are impacting our body as it exists right now, we're really starting to understand from a scientific perspective that it's not just a little thing here or there, like, hey, you need to eat less carbs tomorrow. It could be something as simple and and maybe even as complicated as you're sleeping like two hours less a day than you need to be sleeping. Mm. And and until you get that under wraps, it doesn't matter how much oatmeal you eat. Mm. (laughs) You're still going to be fat. Dang it. That sucks. Mm. Um, or, Or it might be something, something as deep as, you have some unresolved trauma from your childhood and it's causing your immune system to respond in an extremely sensitive way to a variety of foods Mm. that's got to be dealt with and and your immune system needs to be addressed such that your body doesn't respond so intensely to these things. Otherwise you'll continue to get injured and you'll continue to respond sensitively to, to a myriad of different foods and stuff. And so you said it really well, there, there's a big intersection of the disciplines of psychology, counseling, epigenetics, nutrition, exercise. There's a big intersection of these things because, because you know, whether people want to, to wrap their heads around it or not, all of those things are, are a factor and mm. how you feel, how you look, how you perform, how you recover, and, and how you think. Yeah. So, so as, a, as a health coach of now 17 years, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. you've been working tirelessly at being able to change people's lives. Um, with the knowledge uh, of what, what you have been armed with, with this intersection of epigenetics, um, you, you know, genetics, uh, health and nutrition, uh, psychology, the roadmap that really kind of comes to the surface, I would imagine that, that 
no roadmap is the same for one person that it is to the for, for the other. So, uh, being able to unravel this, <clears throat> this these knots, these strings of uh, health, the health matrix. Um, how do you really decipher that, that that roadmap from individual to individual? I'm just really smart. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and that comprises the podcast. God, it's been great. Well done, uh, well done. Well done. <laughs> Well done. No, no, and and I'm glad you said that because because really my role as a coach, at, you know, when I first started coaching, I thought I had to be the smartest person. I had to know everything so I could help people figure out what it is, the magic bullet, the linchpin thing they needed to change in order to to make progress. You know, so I saw people kind of from a chemical engineering perspective, like like if you drew a box around them, and the inflows were this, and the outflows were this. What do we need to tweak in here to get this machine to do what it's supposed to do? You know, that that was how I looked at it. I was young and dumb, but but you know, there's a lot of the fit, there's a lot of the fitness industry that approaches people like that. Yeah. In in the the process of learning and in the process of working with a lot of people, instead I, I tend to see the individuals that I work with and and indeed the the people in our community. I tend to see people as everybody has their own story. And even if I knew exactly what changes they needed to make up front, whether or not they would actually do them and actually stay with them and whether or not their life would align around those things could be another thing altogether. I'll give you an example. Like, let's say I could come up with the perfect meal plan for every person. Like, like Tom, here's the perfect meal plan for you. Six pack abs in the next six months. You can do this, right? Hey, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Now, the problem is Tom doesn't exist in a vacuum. Tom has other priorities. Tom has a partner. Tom has dogs. Tom has shit to shovel. Or no, that was that was Paul. Uh, but, yes, true. But, but, <laughs> but the perfect plan doesn't matter if it cannot be executed. And and so to your question, this is where we've started this this one percent better daily approach mm. uh, it, very simply it's look where are you right now if everything went well for you if you could picture freaking heaven a year from now you know being within reason and you could picture what progress looks like what's that look like okay what are you willing to start changing and what's that tiny little step you can make today Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you compound those tiny changes over time, then, well, you actually, you actually transform because if you can become 1% better every day for the next year, you won't recognize yourself next year. Like you'll, you'll look in the mirror, like, who is that guy? What, what happened to that guy? Like, yes. how did I do all those things? You know, and, and <clears throat> really where the rubber meets the road for us. And this, this is scientific. Okay. Because they took. They took uh, weight loss programs. Weight loss isn't the only thing that we do, but weight loss is something that's really important to people sure. right now in the world. So, so they took weight loss programs and they took keto and they took Atkins and they took Ornish and they took Whole30 and they took all these programs and they lined them up side by side and they did a meta-analysis to say, okay, what works? What actually works? What helps people lose weight? What helps people make changes? What what actually works and and they found <laughs> this this blew my mind when I read it. This was a 2017 study. This blew my mind. What they actually found was there were two components that actually made a difference, and the two components were this: one, a supportive community who was also working on the same goals you were; two, a professional who would answer your questions. Wow! Those were the two. Th those were the two things that that predicted success better than what type of diet you were doing, yeah. whether or not you like you know had all the money in the world, whether or not you had pre existing conditions. It didn't matter. It was those two things. So it's like, look, do your Atkins, do your keto, do your Whole Thirty, whatever, but don't do it alone. Mm. You have somebody to ask questions to who you trust to give you good answers because that's going to make all the difference in the weight loss perspective. And that, yeah. and that then opens that door up for you to be consistent. And if you miss that day, that 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 day where you, you fell down, you get back up the day after that, and you keep strong because you have a community, you have somebody to 
and you have a, 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 somebody to support you and ask you questions and to be a support network, it makes so much sense. Like it's so mm. the psychology and the behavioural aspects associated with this is so much more important than the science behind the nutritional aspects because without the behavioural aspects, the science is meaningless. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's the, it's the difference between <clears throat> being you know, the, the the theoretical physicist and being the engineer, you know, the theoretical physicist could say the equations work out and the engineer's boots on the ground going, yeah, but those pieces don't fit together like that in the real world, man. And, yeah. and that's the same thing with regard to actual real people. You could say, oh, the science this and all oh, the science that. And if you eat 40% of your calories from blah, 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 then, then, you know, you'll see two pounds of weight loss more in the next 12 weeks. It's like, yeah, but who lives like that? Yeah. Like yeah. no real person. <laughs> That's <laughs> no, so true. Nobody lives like that. And also it's like, it's, the, it's, it's those results work if you do that. But what the question we're all trying to um, um, answer here is how do you make the person do that? And what really spoke to me when you, you spoke about that meta analysis is that a community, um, You've got connection, empathy, inclusivity there. That's like, oh my God, I'm not alone. People are here doing the same thing as I am. And then with yes. the leader, you've got a North Star. You've got someone who actually I've got was was were there any kind of specifics around that leader? Was it someone who had done what they were trying to do, or was it just a professional um, theoretically? Or? Great, great question. It was the presence of a professional to answer the questions. Now, now it, it didn't matter if that professional did or didn't like you know, go through the same thing you went through. Like, I don't have to have lost a hundred pounds to be the yep. professional you ask about your hundred pound weight loss journey. Now we've, we've been really specific about the body here, particularly, but in, in better daily, we're, we're, we're concerned with mind, body, and spirit. Like, um, so, so the other, the other thing to wrap your head around is, is not just like, Oh, I made a change to my nutrition and now I've lost 10 pounds. The question is, are you better? Mm. You know, are, are you, yeah. do, do you feel better? Do you, do you speak better? Are you more kind to your children? Are you a better mm. person at work? You know, like, yeah. like, like these things. And, and this kind of goes to what you were saying about the community, these changes that we look at making to our bodies oftentimes start as a very shallow start. It's a very shallow process. Like I don't look the way I want to look, or, you know, I don't, I don't feel the way I want to feel or something like that. But, but when you get down to the nitty gritty, it's, it's really, I'm not the kind of person I would like to be, or maybe even deeper than that. I'm not making the most of myself and I know it. Yeah. So how do I change that? Well, you, you start with the small step forward and, and you build on that. Um, and, and that's how it works. <laughs> I mean, so so this is um, just to give you a bit of background. Um, I'm I'm um, currently in like kind of like a third year equivalent of a science degree in, in um, psychology, and one of the reasons why I really wanted awesome. to do that, yeah, yeah, it's, it's I'm really enjoying it, and and what, one of the reasons why I really wanted to do it is because I'm naturally such an open minded individual, and I think about and Paulie can attest to this. You know, whenever we're trying to think about you know what to do in the podcast, I'm thinking 40 years away and Paulie's like, all right, dude, what, what are we going to do tomorrow? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's actually been really good for me to, to, you know, take it one step at a time. And one of the things that I really love about the way science works, at least in the psychology fields, is that when you're um, proposing research or when you're um, undertaking a study, you have to define the variables and then you also have to explain to the reader how you operationalize those variables, you know. So if you're doing something on I'll give an example we're doing at the moment. Um, does an emotional appeal that induces anger um, have an effect on climate change? And for, for us to be able to show you scientifically that there is a significant relationship there, we have to define what anger is and we also have to define what climate change is and how we can measure those two things. And and I know it sounds um, uh, long-winded, but uh, I'll, I'll bring it back to, to what you're talking about. One of the things that I really notice in, in, in my work as a counselor is that people will come in and they, their pain points are really, really ambiguous. So they'll say things like, I hate myself, you know, or I'm depressed, or I don't know who I am. 
And one of the things that I found that works really well is when you start to break those things down and operationalize them, you know, it, it, we really start to see, it, it helps them see how they can make progress in those, er- in those areas. And I think uh, the, the reason why I brought this up is because what you were speaking to then resonated with me so much in a sense that you have, you know, you have all these people saying, I want to lose weight. I want to, you know, A, B and C. And then the, the, the most important question is, how is this actually going to apply to your life? You know, how can we actually operationalize? How can we show that you're making progress in being better with your kids? You know, um, being able to run up a hill. So do you, do you have ways that you, you kind of help your clients break down these otherwise potentially ambiguous goals to actually help them see the progress that they're making in those areas? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I, I can't quite claim credit for it either. Uh, this is a this is a technique I picked up from Jordan Peterson's work, actually, mm. where uh, you know before before working with with clients again, my my young trainer self drawing a box around people and trying to you know figure out the the thing. I I would <clears throat> I was a good trainer still, and I would ask them, you know, what are the measurable things we can do to understand whether or not we're seeing progress. And this was things like measuring our body fat percentage on a regular basis, maybe increasing our uh, the speed of our mile time, right? So I used to run a nine minute mile and now I can run a seven minute mile, you know, I'm making progress. Or or maybe we would get down to like, what's your dress size? And, mm. and we would, you know, shrink that down. And and I got as, as deep as, you know, measuring waists and hips and thighs and and biceps and chests and necks, just, just so people could see, like you lost six inches around your waist mm. and your chest got about four inches bigger. Like you're growing muscle and, and losing fat, visceral fat. Awesome job. Right. Mm. So, so these are operational and measurable things. And what's really interesting about this. And, and, and I, I saw this very regularly. These were the measures I took as a trainer to see that my program was working well for the client and to prove that the resources and energy that they were putting toward what we were doing was working for them. Also, though, I would still find that people could gain 12 pounds of muscle and lose, you know, 20 pounds of fat and and get faster at their mile time and, and blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> they still weren't real happy with themselves. And it was like, <clears throat> why? Like everything's working. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. What's going on, man? Uh, it says it on and, the paper right here. It says it on the spreadsheet. Why it says it's you, working. Right? Like, it says that you're happy. Great job. Like, yes. <laughs> you know, I was there when you did all the burpees. Yes. Okay, burpees aren't a great exercise anyway, but I was there. You sweated and you breathed hard and, and all that stuff. Um, but uh, I'll give you an example. So, so I worked with a woman who was widowed at 50. And, and she loved her husband dearly. They had a wonderful marriage and relationship. He left behind a daughter and and she lost him to pancreatic cancer. It was, it was pretty Mm. tragic, right? She started working with me about a year and a half later and she had gained some weight in the grief process. You know, you guys did a podcast on grief recently. It's, it's not, it's not easy to go through the grief process, but she had gained some weight in the grief process. Uh, She had a very, very stressful job. Her daughter was moving to college, you know? And so she came to me and, and, and again, this was, this was the younger version of my, myself than, than I am now, but, but she came to me and she said, I need to lose about 12 pounds to get to my fighting weight. That's why I'm hiring a trainer. So great. Mm. And so that's what we did. And, and over a period of about six to eight weeks, we lost 12 pounds, you know, cause it was, a, it was a matter of, of getting her diet where she knew she needed to be getting her back into her exercise regimen, which she had maintained for a long time prior to her husband passing and, and, you know, to balance her sleep and, and work. Right. So, so we did those things. And six to eight weeks later, she had achieved what she really set out to achieve, at least what she told me, right? However, she's like, can I keep working with you? I'm like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm not going to kick you out. You know? Of course. <laughs> what, else would you, what else would you like to work on? And, and she goes, I, I don't really know what my fitness goals are now. I just, you know, I just know that I need this in my life. Mm. And, and what I found is as we continue to work together, she needed somebody to help her work through the grief process yeah. who was not interested in taking her to dinner, you know, like, yeah. like, like she just, she needed somebody to, 
Hey, pardon my French. She needed someone to bitch and whine at about her job while she did leg press. Totally. You know, um, and then to walk in and say, man, I feel like garbage from my travel and, and be like, hey, lay back there, take some deep breaths. I'll get you stretched out. We're going to hit the hit the weight floor and have a great workout today. Mm. She just needed that, you know. Um, and and so if you asked her before, what does better mean to you? She would have said, I need to lose 12 pounds. But if you would have asked her after she lost 12 pounds, what's better mean to you? It's like, ah, you know, at, at this point in my life, I, I need I need a friend yeah. who isn't going to let me whine and complain and is going to help me be a better version of myself while I kind of get my feet under me. And, mm. and that, that in my mind, that's a really good example of, of what, what people go through regularly when they're they're trying to make a change from a health and fitness perspective. But it's quite a few layers deep. Mm. Well, yeah, that's poignant uh, for me. I've got a, uh, a, a person in my life, who, a student that I've uh, trained for a long time, and he had a very tumultuous relationship Um where he and his partner parted ways uh, and, you know, during that process he also put on a, a bunch of weight and it, after that, once the dust had settled, once he had done some soul searching and it, uh, together we had kind of, uh, you know, worked, laughed, done, done the whole gamut, you know, um, he just had time to be able to resolve things within himself and essentially be happy um Mm -hmm. regain that that zest for life again and what he found was he was in the best shape of his life and he was not changing what he ate he wasn't changing the exercise he did uh dramatically but the chemicals that were being uh spawned and the chemicals that were being uh activated in his body due to positive thought processes yeah the way he felt about exercise and life in general um, had a tremendous impact on his health and it, and it showed in his body. hundred mm-hmm. percent. And and that happens over and over and over again. Uh, here's, you guys will find this very fascinating. There's a study that came out in 2019. It didn't get a lot of press because, you know, COVID hit right after that and it kind of swept the whole world. But, um, but this really interesting study, they took college students And what they were doing is they were trying to test whether or not the belief about our bodies changed its physiology or not. And so so what they did is they put these college students through a cardiovascular exercise test. And so in this test, the treadmill starts at, you know, six miles an hour and then it speeds up 0.2 every minute. So it gets faster and faster and faster. Right. Eventually you quit. Like it's hard enough that eventually you're like, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to die if I keep doing it. <laughs> and, and, and so, and so they, they, they did this treadmill test. Right. And so they got, they got baseline average for everybody who stopped and, and when they stopped and all that stuff. And then they put them in two groups. They told the college students that they were testing for an endurance gene. They told the, the students that they were testing for an endurance gene that Olympic athletes who are good at endurance have. And so, so they took a blood draw and, and tested for this gene. But what they didn't tell the college students is that they were going to randomize <clears throat> who they told had the gene. Mm. So, so they had a group of people they told had the gene. <clears throat> and they had a group of people they told, sorry, you don't have the endurance gene. And they brought them back eight weeks later. And, and so they did the treadmill test again. Now, now what's crazy about this test is... They actually knew who had the genes and who didn't. And they were able to test the actual belief about whether or not you had the endurance gene versus the effects of of having the gene. Wow. And what they found is the group who was told that they did not have the endurance gene stopped 30% sooner than they did last time. And not only that, because that's that's belief, right? Like, "Ah, I don't have the endurance gene. And why should I continue anyway? Beep, I'm done. Not only that, but the carbon dioxide buffering that they measured during the test. So this is how quickly and easily your body gets rid of the carbon dioxide produced by high intensity exercise. Their carbon dioxide buffering went down. Mm -hmm. So the belief that they didn't have the gene made them stop earlier and made their bodies worse at buffering carbon dioxide. 
that's mm. nuts. Mm. Like if, if, if that doesn't make your hair, hair stand up on end, it should freak you out. And you should probably rewind and listen to that one more time because, because it was, it was not whether or not you had the gene. Yeah. It was, it was whether or not you believed you didn't. And yeah. like that, that made a difference at a physiological level. Yeah. It's, that's remarkable. And that's just like placebo effect in its, all its glory, right? Like, Mind blowing. Well, is that the nocebo so, or the placebo? If it's the not belief well, it in, it depends which side well, of the. Well, that's, a, that's a good question. Actually, I, and and no offense, but I actually hate the term placebo. And the reason is is because we we use that in in science sure. in order to test whether or not something does or doesn't have an effect that's greater than our belief, right? But but what this study kind of broached the subject of was what is the what is the impact of our mental like the top down belief what is the impact of our actual belief on our neurophysiology yes. like like it's not it, it's it's just it's crazy to think like i know this and i think you guys know this but the vast majority of the population has no idea it's crazy to think that you can literally change how your body buffers carbon dioxide on a on a belief yeah and, and like if you imagine if you carry that around for 10 years i don't have the endurance gene i suck at endurance i'm not very good at this like of course you're going to be out of shape like totally <laughs> not only are you, not only are you not going to do cardio very often but you're also when you do it you're going to suck at it like yeah. that's that's terrible yeah that's terrible it, it reminds me of the the milkshake experiment yeah are you, are you familiar with that one explain it to me it doesn't ring a bell it's a i'll explain it really briefly um it, it was a once again a split study uh in regards to a randomized study where they selected a number of participants uh and they were delivering a milkshake to these participants one was the delivery of the the, the information being this is uh, an indulgent milkshake that is meant to be a dessert. So um, it's high in calories, it's high in su- sugar, it's high in fat, et cetera. And the other one is, is this, this new whiz-bang uh, health milkshake that, uh, mm. you know, is is going to uh, essentially make you thinner, you know. Um, uh, and what what was interesting about this study and i've got to recall the uh the details of it but from memory uh it was the the people and it was very clear correlation the people that um had that milkshake that were that that believed it was a um you know an indulgent milkshake um not only got fuller quicker but the ghrelin levels in their stomachs were measured mm. And that was significantly uh, activated at a, at a much quicker rate than the other people. Yep, just make it makes perfect sense. Uh, I I, uh, I had an interview on my podcast with a, a guy named Doctor Tro, and uh, he gets a lot of flack from the the calories in, calories out community. He's a he's a big proponent of of helping people who are significantly overweight manage their symptoms and decrease their weight naturally over, over time. Uh, anyway, he says, oftentimes the scientific community forgets that the body is attached to a head <laughs> and the head really matters <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, because what, because what the, what the head does or doesn't think or doesn't, doesn't believe makes a difference. I, I had a client, uh, who, when we first started working together, I asked people to tell me what their heaven looks like. So if we did everything right a year from now, what does life look like for you? And and I have them describe it to me. Imagine if we did everything right. What could that look like? You know, what does it look like at work? What does it look like with your family? What do you look like in the mirror? That sort of thing. And then I want you to tell me your health and fitness hell. Uh, imagine we like, uh, like, what does that look like? What does it look like for you to be in hell next year? And his verbatim, he said, <laughs> I'll, I'll have lost weight, but we'll have to run all the time to maintain it. That's what he said to me. <laughs> and so... So he was diametrically opposed to running. He did not like that idea. And, yeah. and so when we started working working together, I was like, well, we need to do some cardio. Running is usually the easiest thing to get into because it doesn't require a lot of equipment or anything. You just put some shoes on. And he goes, I'm not a runner. I was like, that's fine. That's fine. What if you were just a guy who ran sometimes? <laughs> and he goes, 
I, you know, I maybe I, I might be able to do that. I was like, I'm not trying to train you to run a marathon. Just what if, <laughs> what if we tried to just jog like two minutes and then walk and then jog two minutes and then walk. And then what if we just tried to do that? And, and he was like, you know, I think I'm open to it. And unbeknownst to him, and I explained this to him, there was a large Taiwanese biobank study where they took all of the different types of exercise against the obesity genes. So there's 18,000 participants in this study. They screened wow. these participants for seven potential obesogenic genes, meaning if you have all seven of these, the likelihood that you'll be obese is significantly higher than the average population. And what they did is then they brought these 18,000 participants in and just measured them. And they asked them, what kind of exercise do you do? And the, the, there were six exercises that were six types of exercise, six exercise modalities that were protective against obesity, given these genes. So the people who came in and were measured, they weren't fat, even though they had the fat genes, basically. Right. And, and running, running was number one. Oh, wow. Like participants who participants who reported running on a regular basis. Now that was pitted against cycling. That was pitted against swimming. That was pitted against dancing. So it wasn't a calorie thing. In mm. fact, uh, most, most people know that cycling burns more calories than running generally, uh, mm -hmm. per, per hour. Um, especially if you're an efficient runner, right? So, so there's something about the movement pattern and walking was number two, by, by the way. So if you're listening to this and you're like, my knees are bad. I can't go for a run. Go for a walk, man. Like, <laughs> wow, that's so interesting. Seem to work well. Walking, um, walking such a, uh, it's such an activity that just gets zero attention because it's just seen as recreation or getting easy or another. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's the word. Yeah, it's it is easy. easy. Yeah, it's too yeah. easy. It's 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 only one percent better every day. That can't possibly work. <laughs> Not yeah, possibly. yeah, yeah. It can. Yeah, I can. Um, but anyway, so this guy, he, thanks for indulging my longer story, but so this guy, <laughs> That's he, great. he did, he did my two days a week of, of running in addition to his, some of his weight training and he made a few changes to his nutrition and fast forward four months later, he's down 30 pounds. Wow. He's lost wow. seven inches around his waist. He's fitting into stuff. He hasn't fit in a while. He's getting compliments at work. And, and, uh, I said, so are you ready to say you're a runner yet? And he's like, <laughs> No, but I'm I'm okay with being a guy who runs sometimes. <laughs> I was like, okay. Dude, okay. that is uh, that is so powerful. Sorry, I, I I really want to speak to that, but I think I cut you off. <laughs> go, go ahead. That that's just that top down thing. Is is like I'm not a runner. I'm not a runner. I'm like shut up. How about if you're a guy who runs sometimes? How about we, we try that and see yes. how it fits? Yes. It's, it's interesting because and I know and now I'm cutting you off, Tom. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. This is Tom and I have talked about this where identity plays such a big role. Yeah. Yes. yes. Whereas we, we we think about identity saying I am a runner can be a really, really powerful um role to <clears throat> into with your with the person you've been working with. It was actually quite a um uh, it was a sensitive um identity shift for him to step into and i feel like there was mm -hmm. a lot of fear surrounding that so if he could get one percent towards that role of just being a person who ran from time to time who knows what's going to happen in 365 days maybe he is a runner you know yeah, that that's that's right and even if he's not who he cares? cares like who cares? his his body gets the benefit of being a runner you know exactly, <laughs> it exactly right exactly. It, it's it's amazing stuff and i think like what what i'm really loving <clears throat> about um, about what, what you're saying, Alex is, is like getting into the really nitty gritty of, you know, not only pe people's goals and, you know, I'm, I'm a giant Jordan Peterson fan as well. And I think those ideas around heaven and hell are so wonderful, you know, because it gives you a continuum. It not only enables you to figure out where you are on that continuum, but what progress would be like. And I've heard him say things in the past, like maybe heaven is too far away for you at the moment. Maybe a lesser hell is what we need to aim towards. And that there's, there's so much practicality in that, you know, which I, which I really love. But I think um, one of the things that really spoke to me just then about what you were saying is that, getting into the nitty gritty to understand people's schemas and ideas around what these words actually mean. You know, um, mm -hmm. when you say you're not a runner, 
when you just close your eyes and, and you see running, like, what does that world look like to you? You know, and, um, and, and, you know, we were getting a, a relationship therapist to come on the show, um, in the not too distant future. And she speaks a lot about this in her book. And, you know, most of the time when couples engage in conflict, they're not talking about the same thing. You know, we've got two different ideas of what we're talking about here and we need to get down to where we're actually on the same page and then find some compromise. And, you know, I think, um, when, uh, you know, I mean, the easiest way we can do it is we can all shut our eyes and picture an airplane, right? We're probably going to see three different things. We might not even be in, you know, Paulie might be in the airplane, might be looking at the cockpit. Alex might be at the outside Mm. looking at the airport, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard to, to get onto the same level, but, my question for you, Alex, is when you're actually breaking down these definitions and ideas, you know, you're almost becoming like an existential therapist here and getting to find the the, the edge for your clients, you know, find the point that the, 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 uh, the, the bar that they can set that if they started to work towards completing that initial thing, that would be on the progress journey for them. Do you have um, um, a, a method? I'm speaking selfishly because I'd like to take this into therapy. Um, a, a, something that helps you kind of set a bar for them that's right for them, that then they can start to feel like they actually can enact change? I, that's a good question. And I don't mean to be esoteric here, but there's a few things I could say about that. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is in my interactions with clients, I'm, I'm, I am working to, I'm work, working to replicate the process for them that I've used for myself to navigate away from the hell of Ehlers Danlos. That's, that's really yes. what I'm trying to do. And what I've noticed in, in my, my experience with, with that is if something catches my attention and scares me a little bit, that's exactly what I need to be up to. If something if something grips me, makes me curious, makes me interested, right? Because because I don't get to control that. I don't get to control what I'm interested in or attentive to, right? It's almost like something inside of me calls to that thing, right? So like weight training for me is extremely important, and I believe it needs to be a part of everybody's program, but maybe not to the extent that it is in mine. But I didn't know when I was 15 years old, and I had a hunger for picking up iron weights and just you know, feeling strong, you know, and, and, and going through like, what kind of psychosis is this that you're, I've finished. I like, I mean, really no weight training is like a weird sort of psychosis. I pick things up, I put them down and, and I do it over and over and over again. And every time I do it, I try to do it one more time or I try to make the weight heavier. Like, what is that? What is, like, I'm a dad, I'm a business owner. I've, I've got a wife. I've got chickens in my backyard. There's 500 other things I could be doing right now, but I'm going to make sure that stupid barbell gets over my head 10 times times three, dang it, right? Um, and, and, a, and a part of me loves that. Mm. And it's not just like, oh, I feel strong and stuff. There's, there's a part of me that loves that. And I didn't know this about myself when I was 16, but if my muscles were not well conditioned, then I had nothing to hold my joints together since my ligaments and tendons were too stretchy. Mm. And I still encountered injuries, right? I still encountered injuries and, and doctors would say things like, you probably shouldn't run anymore. Um, maybe you need to, maybe you need to stop lifting weights. They would say things like that to me. And I'm thinking like, no, no, yeah. no, like that. It doesn't like, I hear you yeah, and I respect what you're saying, but I know that's not right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and what's crazy is as we've learned about this disease and as I've learned about myself, if I don't exercise regularly, I get worse and it's a compounding problem, right? It's, it doesn't, it never lets up. There's never a, there's never a place where I'm like, Oh, I'm fine and dandy. And now maybe I can work out again. Mm. It's, it's a, it's a degradation process unless I'm building myself up. Right. Mm. And I, and I find that with my clients, I find that my clients already know a little bit if i can ask them and if i can if i can hear their story and i can listen well they already know the thing that catches their attention and scares them a little bit they already know it yeah so if i say if i say where do you want to be a year from now and even if they're they're 
as you said earlier, even if their goals are kind of ambiguous and amorphous and, and cloudy, right? If I said, what, what could we do today? What do you know we need to get started on today? They might not know that it needs to be 20 minutes of 10 sets of resistance training with a walk up the hill five times, mm. but they would say, you know, I need to start exercising. Like, mm. I don't know what that looks like. I know what equipment I have available. Maybe I need to join a gym. I'm not even sure where I'm going to do it in my house, mm. but, but I know I need to start. And so, so, and so I can say, awesome, let's do that. Let's start there. Mm. And they may, they may be like, you know what? My nutrition kind of sucks, but I'm not really sure like where. I just know I'm not eating well. And so I can say, you know what? How about we start tracking our food? How about we start writing down everything we eat? I don't care about the calories. I don't care. Like you're not, you're not reporting to me to get an A plus. You're just, you're just checking off like, hey, look, this is what I'm eating. And you're starting to become aware of the food that's coming in your face. And if we start there, if we start, hey, three days a week, we're gonna walk and do 20 minutes of weights and here are the exercises. And and every day of the week, you're gonna send me your food journal and and you're gonna get a high five and a slap <clears> on the butt saying, hey, nice job, way to be honest with yourself yeah. about what you're eating. Then Then we can go places from there. I can go, hey, you know what? Like for what you said your goals are, you're not eating enough protein. Mm. So let's, let's start figuring out where we can get more protein in our day or Hey, yeah. for your goals. Like I know you hate that whole walk jog thing and it's really bothering your knee right now. So maybe we need to do a few things to strengthen your knee and, and dial back to just walking and maybe doing some cycling right now. Right. So, yeah. so this 1% better every day is where the rubber meets the road. You start moving forward, you find the obstacles, you deal with those obstacles and you keep moving forward. That's that's how it works. So so moving forward, from what it sounds to me, and I apologize for putting words in your mouth, but moving forward is actually like the motivation comes from having something to run away from moreover, or at least on par with having something to look towards. For me, that's been very true. In yep. fact, for much for much of my life, running from something has been way more helpful than trying to run. I didn't know what life. I, so I grew up in a house without a dad, and and I didn't know what a happy family looked like. I knew I wanted one, but I didn't know what it looked like. Right. Mm. So, so you know, I knew that I didn't want to be addicted to drugs. I knew that I didn't want to have stupid friends. I knew that I didn't want to be in pain all the time. Uh, and I knew that I didn't want fleas in my house or whatever else, you know, I, I, I had a, I had a good picture of what I didn't want mm. and that, that moved me forward pretty regularly. However, as I've, as I've matured personally, I can start looking into the future and say, what do I want for my boys now? What yeah. do I want for my wife now? What do I want for myself now? Mm. And I can start picturing that a little better and, and it's motivating for sure. But, you know, hell's still right there. So mm. you got to make sure the flames don't get too close to your heels, so to speak. <laughs> I love that, man. That's that's very much. Alex, we, we could honestly, um, I'm just going to extend the invitation to have you back on the show. Because yeah. I feel like there's so much to uncover in, in our discussions together. Um, but we're going to have to finish this conversation at some stage. Um, I, I'm glad you're watching the time. I just looked down. I was like, holy cow, that was an hour, man. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, it's been such, just like that. It's been a great hour. It's been it's been a great hour, and we would I, I I think I speak for Tom as well. We'd love to have you back on the show because uh, we're, we're all very much on the same page when it comes to philosophy and um, uh, yeah, I just love chatting to you, man. So it would be it would be great to have a yarn. But um, thank you once again for all the the wisdom that you've imparted on how you've been able to treat yourself, how you've been able to treat your. Uh, your clients and your community, where can we find you and where can people um, find out more about what it is that you do and the community that you hold? Yeah. And and thank you guys. You have a very uh, good ethos and spirit about what you're up to. And I, I honestly don't know a whole bunch about you guys. So I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. That's what, <laughs> one of the things I love about the podcasting world is you can brush shoulders with people that you're like, man, how do we not know each other? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's so, uh, so really, it really is. Uh, that said, my my website and how people can get connected to our community, we have an app so you can run it on, on your browser or you can run it uh, via your mobile phone, whether you're an Android user or Apple user. You can find that at betterdaily.live slash app. 
That's betterdaily.live slash app. And we have a freemium account, so you, you can hop in there and, and get started. Uh, a lot of what we do as a community revolves around challenges and encouraging and supporting each other. So uh, that's betterdaily.live slash app. And if you're like, ah, I've got plenty of apps, where can I find you on social media? You can find me on Twitter, Insta- Instagram, and Facebook at Just Better Daily. Um, I will say that I'm I'm a little cheekier and feistier on social media just because that helps the algorithm. Wink, wink. But um, if, you, if you want if you want the support or encouragement of a, of a good community, you'll find that more in the app than you will on the social media side of things. Brilliant, awesome, mate! Thank you once again for coming on the show. We can't wait to have you again. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Tom, very much for Body Meets Mind. And I did. I know, I know we're running over here, but I did have to address this whole question of whether or not you could have a gym for shoveling shit. Inside. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, I, yes. I, I think, I think a, a functional fitness program that had a community service component to it would be like a mind blowing and powerful thing. So if it's like, mm. Hey, we're going to work out and we're going to help this widow with her terrible yard yeah. real quick, or we're like, hey, we're gonna work out, but our local our local community has like a tractor broken down on the road. Like, let's go pick this sucker up and carry it somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. A tractor's pretty dang heavy, but you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> yes. Um, like, I, I think that would be epic and and a lot of fun to do. So, so I think you'd have to have like a base level of fitness. There'd have to be a facility wherein we prepare for said community service projects. But I think that that organizing a fitness community around strenuous manual labor that nobody does anymore people really like manual labor and you make great friends when you're sweating and and you know heaving and that sort suffering of and it's so true it's yeah, so true Suff- suffering makes for great friendships i'm it sure does. you guys have a story about how you suffered together because otherwise you wouldn't be doing a podcast together did i suffer every <laughs> time i have to co-host a show with Paul? no i'm talking about <laughs> The feeling is mutual, man. The feeling is mutual. This will probably be our last show. <laughs> this, is, this is basically like shoveling shit. That's this is shoveling shit. shit. <laughs> no, Alex, mate, thank you. Such a pleasure. And um, uh, always always a pleasure, Paulie. And uh, and we'll, we'll talk very soon. Thanks so much again. And, and just to round up the beginning of that podcast, the rains, they have met. Have they? <laughs> there you go. Exactly 60 minutes from Rye. To Melbourne, I am in a massive shitstorm. Right? Yeah, <laughs> get shoveling, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon. <laughs>